Good morning, everyone. Please turn with me your Bibles to John chapter 6, verse 1. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time this morning. Father, these are crazy times that we are living in. They are times of uncertainty, and we are thankful that you are the rock on which we stand. Pray that everyone who hears this, Lord, that you would take this word and do in their hearts that which only you can do, and that is change a life. We ask in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, After these things, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone, to receive a little. Do you ever feel like what you do matters little or nothing to God? Maybe you don't stand behind a pulpit or teach a class or sing on stage. Although I can promise you that doing those things doesn't ensure feelings of significance. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I've looked at my service to Christ and the results that I could actually see, and I've wondered if I was having any impact in the kingdom of God whatsoever. One afternoon, while walking through the Norfolk General Hospital, Dr. Hugh Litchfield heard his name being called from across the lobby. As a man approached, he asked, Hi, Dr. Litchfield, remember me? About 10 years earlier, the young man had visited the church where Dr. Litchfield was serving. He at that time was facing possible jail time over tax violations. This had led to alcohol dependency, which had in turn jeopardized his marriage and his relationship with his children. His life was in a desperate shape. Dr. Litchfield explains the interaction in his book, Visualizing the Sermon. He then said to me in that lobby, I want to thank you. Puzzled, Dr. Litchfield replied, for what? The man then began his story. One Sunday, you preached a sermon about taking responsibility for our lives and not to blame what we have become on somebody else. God really used that sermon to speak to me. That afternoon, I got down on my knees and prayed to God and promised to take responsibility for my life. With God's help, I did. Since that time, life has been great. I got out of trouble with the IRS. I became the master over the bottle. And now my marriage is better than ever, so I just wanted to thank you. Litchfield then writes, As he left me standing there, I was overwhelmed by what he had told me. When I went back to the office, I dug down into my sermon files to get out that sermon that had meant so much to him. Early in my ministry on Monday morning, I would jot down a phrase or two at the top of my sermon manuscripts as to how I felt the sermon had gone that Sunday. For that sermon, I glanced at what I had written. And the note said, Dead in the water, no one listened. A waste of time. Dr. Litchfield concludes, I have learned something along the way. If we offer faithfully to God what we have, somehow it will be used in magnificent ways. We must never underestimate what God will do with what we give. We're going to see a classic case of that in chapter 6, which records for us the feeding of the 5,000 using only the lunch of a little boy. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. They are called this because they are very similar in content. The word synoptic is comprised of two words. Optic meaning to see and sin. Well, you all know what sin means. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are an account of all the sins they had seen. Not really. The prefix sin actually means alongside. So put together, it would mean to see the Gospels beside one another. The Gospel of John records and omits a lot that is in the other three Gospels. But beside the miracle of the resurrection, do you know the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels? It is the feeding of the 5,000. Also, of all the miracles of Christ, this one always occurs after the rejection of the Jewish leadership and the shadow of the cross begins to fall. 
Look at verse 1 with me. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Here's a delightful story where Lord Jesus decides to take a day off with his disciples. And as they go away, they're having a nice little time. And while they are away, suddenly hordes of people arrive because they have found out where Jesus is. He's been doing a few miracles. He's been healing a few sick people, all kinds of stuff like that. And they hope he's going to do some more, and so they gather around. Although the disciples of Jesus ascended in a mountain, the crowd tracked him down, not so much because they wanted to be with him, but simply because they were curious about him. Having seen his miracles, they no, longer, they no doubt looked at Jesus either as a magician to entertain them or as a physician to heal them. The crowd followed Jesus for all the wrong reasons, and they still do. The crowd mentality is still to manipulate the Lord for a personal private agenda or to get something from him rather than simply being with him. Now, there's no question about it that Jesus had a massive ministry to the curious. I think he will perform this miracle for a number of reasons. For one, he had to establish his credibility. What do I mean? Well, he just couldn't arrive and say, okay, people, I'm God coming in human form. They'd say, sure you are. You know any more good jokes? But if he went around and fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish and said, okay, you guys, I'm God. They might have felt that he had some credibility. He would even say later on in John chapter 10, But if I do then, though you do not believe me, at least believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am the Father. Also, of course, he was meeting needs. They were all hungry, these people. They needed feeding. And he wasn't about to let them starve. So the disciples are looking forward to a nice day off. Actually, the account in the Gospel of Mark tells us the disciples' first reaction to the crowd was to tell Jesus to send them away. But the Lord Jesus looks and he's moved with compassion. Send them away, says the disciples. Feed them, says the Lord Jesus. It is still the difference between many of those belonging to the Lord and the Lord today. We can have the propensity to say, send them away. They don't look like us. Look at that guy, we can say. He has so many piercings, he looked like he fell face forward into my tackle box. Or this person doesn't smell so great. Or this person is just awkward to be around. Feed them, says the Lord. In contrast to chapter 5, where we saw Jesus seeking an individual, as chapter 6 opens, we see a multitude seeking Jesus. From Mark 6.31, we know that as the crowds begin to gather around him, Jesus didn't have time for leisure or even to eat. This is why he said to the disciples, come with me and rest a while. As an aside, it's an invitation still needful today. For if we don't come apart with the Savior, we will come apart at the seams. The problem, of course, was how to meet the needs of such a vast crowd of people. Three solutions were proposed. First, as I alluded to, the disciples suggested that Jesus just sent the people away, as in, simply get rid of the problem. The second solution will come from Philip in response to our Lord's test question, and that is to raise enough money to buy food for the people. The, the third solution came from our Lord, and it was the best solution. No big surprise there, huh? He took a little boy's lunch, blessed it, broke it, and handed it out to the disciples, and they fed the whole crowd. Just as Moses fed the people manna in the wilderness, this greater redeemer will feed the people with five loaves and two fish. And so he is the final mosaic fulfillment of Israel's redeemer, so it also has spiritual significance. Later in that chapter, we will see that after giving them physical bread, he tells them, don't seek for bread that perishes, but the bread that leads to eternal life. So Jesus is going to teach them that this miracle points to a higher significance of just physical bread. 
And that is the spiritual sustenance that he alone can give. Verse 4 tells us that this was during the time of the Passover. We have to keep in mind where the minds of the Jews are at this point. This is the time of the Passover feast. And thus their minds are filled with images of the Passover. They are thinking of eating the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Jesus is not speaking to a bunch of Gentiles like us, but to the Jews who are deeply steeped in the Jewish religion. Keep that in mind, as in a few verses, Jesus is going to compare himself with the manna that came down from the heavens in the book of Exodus. Look at verse 5. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Like the disciples in our account, you have finally just settled down to get some much-needed rest. And then out of the blue pops up another problem you have to immediately deal with. If we aren't careful, the enemy can use such occasions to whisper in our ears that God really doesn't care about us, or he wouldn't allow things like this to enter to our lives. This is a very immature view of both God and the Christian life. If I'm not careful, I can be just as prone to this kind of thinking as the next person, which is dopey, because Jesus himself has told us that as long as we are in this world, we should expect trials and tribulations from time to time, even when we are doing his work. If Nehemiah was here this morning, I bet he would give me a loud amen. Of course, if Nehemiah was here, that would be awkward, since that would mean he wasn't practicing social distancing. When I typed that, a thought popped into my head. Maybe when all this is over, some of us need to continue to practice social distancing. What I mean is, maybe we should persist in distancing ourselves from a society that Philippians describes this way. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Jesus tells us he has left us in the world, but we are not to become absorbed by the world and its values. He has not isolated us, but he has insulated us if we will follow his instructions. Anyway, back to Nehemiah. If you know the Old Testament story, Nehemiah and his workers are into the project. They've just started, and almost immediately they face opposition. A couple of the local governing rulers don't want the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. They're threatened by the progress being made, and they try to trip up Nehemiah as he works for God. A local leader named Sanballat begins to ridicule the Jews. He taunts them, saying that they will never succeed. Tobiah the Ammonite, his buddy, makes what he thinks is a terrific joke. He says, if a fox climbed up on their wall, the wall would collapse. And you thought my jokes were bad. All this, of course, is just the Old Testament version of trolling. But Nehemiah has said yes to God, but that also means saying yes to opposition and persecution. That's just how it works. But sometimes we feel that if we run into problems, that must mean that this isn't God's will. We get the idea that smooth sailing means God is on our side. And so bumps in the road must be the celestial version of a thumbs down. But what if it's just the opposite? Sometimes when we face roadblocks, it is the proof that we're on the right track and doing the right thing. Verse 5 says that Jesus lifted up his eyes and sees a great multitude coming towards them. And he says, quick, fellas, here they come again. Everybody quit talking and hide behind this bush. If you're searching for that, it's not there. I love this about the Lord. Even though the crowd followed him for the wrong reason and would, in the space of this chapter, turn away from him completely, Jesus still had compassion on them. For as Mark's gospel tells us, he looked on them as a sheep without a shepherd. If you're a mom or dad, you know how this works. 
You know when your kids are coming to you for the wrong reasons and when their priorities are amiss or their motives are not right. But you also know that you still love them and are there to take care of them. So too. Every pastor, elder, or spiritual leader must realize that no matter how wrong people might be, it is never right to beat up on them or to come down on them or to point a finger at them. When those in ministry say, if it wasn't for these immature believers, things would really be happening at my church. It only shows that the speaker is not really a shepherd. A true shepherd will never beat the sheep, for he knows he is there to feed the flock. And so Jesus, realizing that these people were hungry, put a plan into action. We must also remember that the matter of eating assumed a far greater importance in ancient culture than it does for most of us who are living today. When we want something, we merely go to the store for it, and it's rare we cannot buy all that we want. Unless, of course, we are talking about toilet paper. Wait a second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, sorry about that. But in ancient times, it was different. Harvests were uncertain. There was not always enough to eat. As a result, to have enough food was considered a great blessing, and food itself became a symbol of prosperity. We can see that this was also important in Christ's time. For later on in this same chapter, the Lord declared to his hearers, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. This should also remind us that men and women find their real spiritual prosperity in God. We cannot find it on the human level. We cannot find the abundant life by indulging ourselves in all that this life has to offer. We cannot find happiness by pursuing it. We cannot create satisfaction. These great blessings come from God. So we must feed on God as he is presented to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, do you feed up on him? Do you come to him expecting to be fed? So we can only imagine the look on Philip's face when Jesus turned to him and asked out of the blue, hey Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? The first person the Lord turned to was Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, and Bethsaida was in that area. It was natural that Jesus should turn to Philip, therefore, for Philip knew more than anyone else what food would be available. The difficulty was that Philip got all caught up in his knowledge. Perhaps he was proud that he knew that area of the country, and he could tell them that there was no place to buy anything, and so he forgot to turn the matter over to Jesus. In simple language, John tells us that Jesus asked Philip about food to test him and implies that Philip failed that test. Where shall we buy bread? It's the only time Jesus appeared to ask for advice. Why did he ask Philip? In order to test him. So too. Jesus puts us in situations where we feel there's no solution in order to show us our progress in the arena of faith. Jesus was not trying to discover what Philip was thinking, for he already knew that. Nor did he need Philip's input to help him formulate a plan. He knew that Philip knew of no place to get bread and had no plan to provide it. The Lord's purpose in questioning Philip, and by extension the rest of the disciples, was to test them. For he himself knew what he was intending to do, and it had nothing to do with buying bread. As he does with all of his people. The Lord poses this dilemma as a way of testing the disciples to strengthen their faith. So it's not like Jesus is drawing a blank here. Wouldn't that be awful? I mean, you ask the Lord something, and with a bewildered look, he just shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't have any idea what we should do. What do you think we should do? That's the definition of a panic attack. But you would think that after the miracles that Philip had seen, his first and immediate response would have been to ask Jesus just to do another miracle. Jesus already has previously proven to them that he had the power over every problem and situation that arose in their lives, yet they have already forgotten. 
If you are in that place this morning and here you are in your own impossible situation and you look at your problems and you evaluate your resources and you come to the conclusion that there is simply no way. And we can so easily forget the incredible track record of God's faithfulness in our lives. It reminds me of the children of Israel that every time they ran into a new problem, even after all the things God had done to deliver them out of Egypt, that every time they got into a new pinch, they would turn to Moses and say, we are so excited to see how God is going to prove himself by coming through again. No. Instead, they would say, why has God, and by extension you, Moses, let us out here in the wilderness to die? This is another reason why God chose Moses instead of me. I imagine if I'd have been Moses, after about the third or fourth complaint, I would have said, you know what, guys? I think you might be right. I think God does want you to go back to Egypt. So you go ahead and start walking I'll just catch up later, when in actuality I would start walking in the opposite direction, glad to be rid of them. Fortunately, I know that God never lets me by with such carnal thinking and is faithful to convict and reprove me. A couple of quick comments on verse 7, then I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your Sunday afternoon. How does Philip respond to the question? Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have even just a little. Now, there is a lot of work that is being done in verse 7. He has already counted the crowd. He's counted the resources. He's figured up how much bread the money can buy, and he realizes, given the size of the crowd, how much each person would be able to get as a result of the resources that he has. He has analyzed everything except the power of God. Now remember, he has been a witness of the miracles of the Lord that he's already done. But he's the kind of guy that likes to calculate, but he's forgotten to include Jesus in his equation. Now I realize, such a blunder is completely foreign to all of us in this church. I'm talking about people from other churches. In Philip's reply, we have a confession of the failure of human resources in the situation. We also have an illustration of the failure of human resources in many circumstances of our own. Yet, rather than focusing on Jesus, Philip's mental computer began to work like a cash register. All he could think about was the total cash that would be needed to provide just a little bread for each person. Sometimes, life on planet Earth can be a demoralizing struggle. Some challenges loom larger than our meager resources. Some demands far outweigh our ability to meet them. Some answers float high above our intellectual reach. And some problems are just too complex to solve. Let's face it, the world is big and we are small. I think because of this coronavirus that many people may be realizing that possibly for the first time in their entire lives. And to make matters worse, we are naturally predisposed to think only on the horizontal plane. Nothing is impossible for God, yet we habitually think in terms of what we have to offer and what we can accomplish through natural means. As we finish up, I want us to realize that without the power of God, we are all essentially powerless. I'll close with a real-life example. The last thing a police officer trying to chase down a suspect in a high-speed pursuit needs to see is a warning that their patrol car is running low on battery juice. That's how it went down one night in Fremont, California. The police officer pursuing a suspect while driving the department's Tesla Model S patrol car noticed it was running out of battery power. The pursuit of a felony vehicle started in Fremont and reached peak speeds of about 120 miles per hour on the highway. The officer driving the Tesla radioed into the dis dispatch that he might not be able to continue the chase he was leading. Officer Jesse Hartman said, I'm down to six miles of battery on the Tesla, so I may lose them in a second. 
The vehicle being chased was found a short time later after it crashed into bushes, but the driver had fled the scene and was not around. Officer Hartman eventually found a charger in San Jose to juice up his car. I guess it's good he knew the way to San Jose, if you know that song. I may have just dated myself there. A police department spokesman said, We have no written policy regarding charging, but the general guideline is that if it should at least be half full at the beginning of the shift. Apparently, the Tesla had not been recharged after the previous shift before Hartman took it out, so the battery level was lower than what it should have been. A spokesman from the department couldn't provide details on why it wasn't charged. Let me leave you with this thought. We also have the danger of running on empty unless we daily connect to the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only then that we will have the power and the endurance in our struggle against daily temptation and the ability to do God's will. Well, tune back in next week and we will see how Jesus handles this problem. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for everyone who's listened. I pray that it would go out and just bear great fruit in every life represented. We ask in Christ's name, amen. See you guys next week.